Hey everybody, it's Kay across White Brindle. Welcome back to the channel. I have a new face for the channel, but not new to my network. Amber is with us today. Hi, Amber. Hi, Kara. It's great to have you here. We're going to obviously have everyone get to know you through today's topic. We have another like interesting topic for the day because as everyone knows on this channel, I'm not afraid to go there and neither are my guests. So before we jump into the topic at hand, what do you want people to know about you, Amber? Uh, um, well, my name is Amber Kozlowski. I am a licensed professional counselor in Colorado. I am a suicide and self-harm prevention counselor, advocate, and trainer. So that's really my area of specialty. Along with doing that counseling, I have a consultation business as well called Kozlowski Consulting. Love it. Yes. So Amber is one of my near and dear of like someone who actually wants to talk about suicide assessment, self-harm, safety planning, all the things I'm also very passionate about. So everyone needs to know you, Amber. I'm very excited to have you on the channel for that reason. So the topic that we wanted to talk about together, because we were both doing kind of a deep dive on this offline, was countertransference hate. So for folks who are like, never heard that term before, how about we start by defining it of like what you learned, what I learned, like where we got our information from. Do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. So Honestly, when you first reached out to me about counter-transference hate to see if I had wanted to do a little something with you on it, it was kind of a new term to me as well. Yeah. And I'm so thankful that you reached out with it. Yeah. So like, I think that just absolutely normalizes for anyone who's watching this video right now that they're like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. It's not commonly known until some of us go like, get that label, like, get that label. So my my lived experience is about to go public in June of this year for anyone who's interested in where this came from. But part of my own work with clients that had suicidal thought was countertransference hate. And so I was in a consult and they said, Hey, this sounds like countertransference hate. And much like Amber, I was like, What is that? Like, I don't know what that is, but that sounds serious, right? It like sounded like a I don't know, bad prognosis or something, like not great. So by definition, if you had to put this into words, now that you've done a little bit of a dive into the content, what would you tell our, our listeners, our viewers? I think maybe the, the easiest way to define this, what I think we've both found in look, taking that deeper dive, this more complex kind of thing is, it's when we have that intersection of aversion and malice, where there's some transference coming from our client. And we, in turn, as usually clinicians or helping professionals, have that counter-transference of sometimes panic, sometimes do I want to do this, sometimes I need to really get rid of this because this feels yucky and icky and I don't really know what's going on with this client. And a lot of times surrounding our topic that we've said we're both passionate about of, of suicide and we're mm -hmm. working with clients over and over on this, this front yeah. that can feel really difficult. Absolutely. So very much resonates because the context for me when this was brought to my attention was I was in a place with a chronically suicidal client who I felt like I was in this in-between unknown place and I was burning out and I was feeling resentful. And so even though this feels heavy to admit, it was like disgust and anger and like, oh my gosh, just, I don't want to be in the unknown anymore. So almost like a, a natural thought of like, please just make a decision. Are you going to live? Or are you going to die? Right. So I can own that as a professional and as a human, like this is very human response to something that already feels he heavy and scary and awful to a lot of us, which is suicide. Like it scares us, keeps us up at night. <laughs> so countertransference, absolutely, as Amber defined it, like malice, aversion, disgust, usually comes with thoughts like I want this to, to end, whatever this is. So usually a dynamic of push pull with clients with suicidal thought um, and our own discomfort, right? That countertransference of I don't want to do this anymore. So with that being said, I feel like a lot of people are like, okay, that seems pretty intense. Let's talk about what it looks like for a clinician in the room. What are some examples you might give, Amber, of how it actually shows up? Yeah, completely. So the article that we originally kind of combed through for this was pretty, pretty dry, pretty hard yeah. to get through, <laughs> but there wasn't a lot out there on countertransference. Hey, and I know you and I both shared with each other that disappointment and there not being much out there, many examples. And I know as I read this probably the third time at this point, I started to recognize even this in my clinical room and that aha moment of, oh, okay, yes, I've, I've seen that being a human and a therapist. I think it can happen to any of us, new and more seasoned clinicians. 
And it can come up in a lot of different ways. For me, where I saw it coming up with a specific client was every time that this client rescheduled with me, I felt this really kind of pit of dread in my stomach that we'd scheduled another appointment. And it was really hard to pinpoint where that was was coming from before really digging into this countertransference hate. And if this client texted me outside of hours with perceived emergencies, I had this initial feeling of annoyance of what is this client going to do? This client felt like they were constantly in crisis and feeling like, what are they going to do it or are they not going to do it? What is their decision? And almost in my mind, wanting them to choose. Of course, I wanted them to choose life, being that I'm a supporting, helping professional, but just this, right. this feeling of let's go, let's let's make a decision. And that's yeah. one of the ways that it can, can show up. It can show up in a lot of different ways, feeling disinterested, not feeling like you're involved in the story anymore, feeling maybe less supportive than you would feel with another client wanting the session to be over. Maybe that dread comes before you're even booking and that dread comes of, all right, when are we going to be done? When is the session gonna be over? Having to hold back the yawns or uh, if you're a telehealth therapist, not scrolling on something else on that screen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thinking about that game of solitaire that you didn't finish before they walked into your room, having those destructive thoughts and feelings when we're supposed to be present and active with our clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like this emotional checking out, I think really resonates as you speak to like all these different factors, people could track and be like, Oh, check, 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 that's me or I've had that. I feel like what we're describing is like the counter transference on steroids, right? Like that's how I would probably describe it to someone if I wasn't being professional, like counter transference, there's all the things you've named. And I feel like this is like an added layer of, I don't have neutrality anymore with the client. I'm, I'm feeling regret or anger or disgust or something that just feels like not good as a helping professional, right? Like this would be a huge flag for someone, especially if I'm playing dread scheduling or even in the midst of the session or almost this like relief when it's over. I think that's something to pay attention to for all of us, regardless of if it's a suicidal client or just the counter transference experience uh, as, a t as, a, as a whole. <laughs> so yes. you and I tried to map out kind of the journey that a person might go through a, a helping professional to go from I'm wanting to be helpful and I'm here and I'm in it with you to this place of like I am not invested I'm checked out do you want to speak at all to that yeah so I think that there's a few different pathways that this can happen and as we mapped out before it can happen differently for those who are maybe newer in the field and those who are seasoned I think that there can be a definite overlap but as we were researching and looking into this, there are some kind of distinct differences there where a newer professional uh, might look at this as going into it almost with like that Superman or Superwoman complex of feeling like they can save the client, that kind of know-all, do-all. If I'm, I'm really there for them, I use the right therapy technique then this person is no longer going to have those thoughts and feelings of wanting to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. Where maybe our more seasoned therapists might see it as um, they have taken those steps, they've taken those labor pains to help the client progress. And for some reason, maybe an unknown feeling reason, they're not progressing and that is met with frustration and maybe some disdain and counter transference. So regardless, each therapist starts out to help. We're helping professionals. We want to support. We want to work through this with the client. And then we see that client decline. I think that's definitely that same theme for the both, mm -hmm. where for some reason the client, it just seems like they're not getting better or they're going up and down, whatever that looks like. I think we should all know therapy is usually not linear. There's right. some ups and downs and bumps and bruises. And, you know, the therapist might try harder, uh, try to really get that client engaged. I know even I've fallen into that trap of, okay, I'm going to ask more questions or I'm going to um, help them out a little bit more. I'm going to make sure I'm more readily texting them or I'm more readily available. So we're, we're really trying harder than maybe we should. We're not letting the client lead anymore. And then the client still doesn't improve. So then maybe the therapist starts to think, what am I doing wrong and starts to get burnt out and exhausted because 
they're now leading the client instead of being side by side with the client. They're more invested. And maybe that client is in their recovery and in that will to live if we're really talking suicide. Yeah. Yeah. So, that resonates. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure. So then maybe we're feeling some helplessness, right? Like feeling that depressive state. I, I've definitely felt that before when someone's not getting better and uh, what am I doing wrong? And what, what piece am I missing instead of thinking, is there a piece that I'm missing? Right. Right. And as you're saying all this, it really speaks to like the human quality of, of this interaction, right? Like this is not us wearing a professional hat when these thoughts and feelings show up. Like this is us working harder than our clients. I'm hearing my supervisor, my old supervisor's voice in my head of like, don't work harder than them. Like that's a flag. But if you're navigating this, if you're watching this video and you're like, I have navigated this on my own, there wasn't someone who gave you this gift of like, hey, this could be countertransference hate. That was the gift that was given to me where I was like, I have no idea what this is. And I'm glad to now have a name for it. I'm glad to have language to it now. Um, And I think that's why we both felt passionate about going on and and talking about this topic, even though it feels heavier as it's connected to suicide. Again, passion that we both have is that we're not talking about countertransference hate. We're not talking about how it like truly does look hateful at some points where we're not neutral and we're having ugly thoughts toward our clients about their suicidal experience. And that doesn't benefit them and it doesn't benefit us. And so the article we're referencing actually implied that un, unaddressed countertransference hate actually precipitated a suicide, right? It's so like, that's heavy too, of like, if we don't address this and we don't heal from this, it could in fact be uh, predicting that they're gonna die by suicide, I guess is the best way to put it. Um, and so I think that's powerful and really heavy too. So for anyone who's like hung in there at this point in the video, Amber, what would we tell them to say like, how do we actually start to heal from this? How do we start to address countertransference hate? We've already implied there's not much research out on this topic. We had two articles that we were able to pull from. And I think there's probably a lot more conversation we could have on the topic, but you and I did come up with some ideas and I would love for you to share some of those with our audience. Yeah, completely. Cause that was a big part of our conversation. Okay, we understand what to do with it. We felt like sometimes maybe articles were a little condemning feeling, especially to our helper hearts and our helper selves. Nobody's getting into this wanting to have a client die by suicide. Of course not. So, you know, a few things. One of the most important things I think that we discussed was just acknowledging that it happened or it happens and giving ourselves grace and room. Like we've been saying, this is a human experience. This is a human interaction We don't need to feel guilty for it happening, but looking at it as an opportunity. Okay, I recognize this is happening. I recognize maybe some countertransference, hate myself. Now, what do I do to move forward with compassion with my client? And that can look like a few different things. Um, Maybe it's getting some consultation surrounding this topic, getting some support from a supervisor or maybe a more seasoned clinician or somebody who's gone through this themselves and putting our heads together and saying, okay, what does this next step look like? Or how can I get some compassionate support? It could also look like, you know, putting ourselves in our client's shoes. How might, how might they be feeling? What does this look like? For them, what would we want our therapist to do or say if we were in a similar situation? I know for myself, it would be very powerful if my therapist came to me and said, hey, you know, I've noticed there's been some things that are a little off the rails for us. And I would really like to work together to maybe right this ship or change some things. Mm -hmm. Let's look at this treatment plan together. Let's come up with some steps together to move forward in this together. It doesn't need to be a relationship ender. We can rebuild this trust and rapport, but first we need to acknowledge that this is in the room and this is what's happening for the both, both the client and ourselves in this situation. Yeah. And I think that's something to like really point out of like a, a natural knee jerk reaction in countertransference hate is to get rid of the client, right. To like abandon the client to say, it's not working and I need to refer, I need to transfer, right? And so like these articles were very clear that that could actually be more harmful than helpful. And if this could be a learning opportunity, a boundary setting opportunity with the client to write that ship, as you said, of like we could make a change that would be really healing for both clinician and client. 
for me, this, this particular idea as part of healing resonates because it's what I had to do for my own, my own counter transference hate was I did put my client in, I put myself in her shoes through a role play in front of a hundred clinicians. So it was kind of spontaneous. I was feeling very frustrated and activated. I happened to be at a suicide prevention conference. One of the big players was there saying, can I have a volunteer for role play? I respected him. And I was like, heck yeah. And I knew immediately it was going to be this client uh, aspects of her that I was going to embody. And I left that role play with a lot more compassion, a lot more gentle thoughts towards the client once I really sat in her experience through the role play. So it really felt like a gift to do that. And to do that amidst a bunch of clinicians was also really fascinating. So not everyone will have that opportunity, but I think that's why we named it as one of the possible ways to heal. It's like, how do we put ourselves there? How do we have compassion again? And are there other ways to do it? Completely. And that's important that we can do that and flip that role. And oh my goodness, you were so brave to do it in front of so many people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know why it just like seemed like it was fluid that day. Whereas like, I didn't even overthink that. I was just like raising my hand and they're like, sure you. Um, but it really, it did serve as a gift. I did go talk to the, uh, the facilitator later and say, thank you. You really helped me. I did staff, you know, somebody that I was struggling with. And I think he could tell as a very seasoned clinician in this field, um, so yeah, I think it was beneficial on both sides. He got to shine and show how this was done in a compassionate way. And I got to have compassion for the client. Um, so yeah, that's one of many ways we can heal. What have we not talked about yet? That's worth calling out as part of healing. Obviously we've said, name it, getting supervision and consultation around it, putting ourselves in their shoes, anything else that I've missed. I think we've we've touched on this without saying it out loud, but boundaries, I think, are worth really giving some voice to. I remember when we were going through this, you had sent me a letter that Dr. Jobes, who uh, came up with the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality, had written about feeling like an emot emotional hostage to a client who he went through a similar situation with, with some countertransference hate. And after reading that, I recognized that in myself as well. When I was a younger clinician, having a specific client in crisis very often, I was, I was working till 9 p.m., 12 p.m. through these crises, thinking that I was supporting and doing everything I could for this client. When really, if I really look at it and I truly break it down, I was breaking almost every boundary that I had for myself professionally, even personally. I don't text anybody else at midnight regardless right. of the situation I'm asleep mm -hmm. so making sure that we are holding to those boundaries yes we need to be there for our clients in crises when appropriate but we also need to use the resources that are available outside of maybe ourselves which is going to serve them better because they're going to learn those boundaries as well and it's also going to serve us better so that we are maintaining those boundaries, we're modeling those boundaries, and we're preventing our own burnout and, and hate malice that can come from depriving ourselves of sleep repeatedly for those kinds of situations. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like Dr. Jobes and other people in my life have echoed this of like, if you wouldn't do this for anyone else, that's something to pay attention to, right? When you're like, I wouldn't be awake at midnight responding to a text for anyone, personal or professional, except this person. Like, notice that. There's something about that that is causing this, you know, the boundary to break down. Um, so I think that's definitely something to keep track of as we go forward with our clients, because it very much contributes to burnout for myself and others who've had to navigate it so far. Absolutely. So obviously, this is the tip of the iceberg for a lot of people, even just hearing this term, maybe for the first time, countertransference hate is a situation that is countertransference with suicidal clients. So that's really where this originated from. Um, I don't think it's restricted to that, but I think that's really where the terminology showed up was working with suicidal clients. So um, it's something Amber and I are passionate about talking about. So that's why we're on this video saying like, hey, let's talk about it with our community here in Colorado and beyond. But if you didn't know this is a thing, you learned something today. So Amber, where can people find you if they have questions about your content, the fact that you're doing trainings on self-harm and suicide and whatnot, where's the best way to reach you? Uh, yeah, so a few places. I try to make it as easy as possible. Um, they can find me at Convenient Colorado Counseling or Kozlowski Consulting or email uh, ajk at convenientcoloradocounseling.com or phone. I can text or call. I will not text back at midnight. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> but that number is 719-755-2158. Perfect. And I'll make sure to put your contact info below the video for convenience for folks. And, you know, as you're watching this video, share some thoughts with us. If you're comfortable, comment below. Let us know if this is a term you'd heard before, if you've done some work around this. I think because I have the lived experience and Amber's also taking this deep dive, like we are now part of your resources when it comes to helping colleagues through this of like, hey, I had the gift of someone saying this is countertransference hate. I feel the need to also do that for others of this is going to help you heal, help you not go through burnout, help you have a different direction with your client. I'm all about that, specifically for suicidal thoughts and clients who are experiencing that. So on that note, Amber, thank you so much for having the conversation with me today. Your wisdom is amazing. I'm so glad we could actually bring this to light for folks. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Here, stay tuned for more videos. We'll see you next time.